Where is the camera? Can I know it? No, no, you look right at Tom. That'll be fine. Now here is Ayn Rand, who is the author, as I say, of uh, The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. And the other one I can't remember because it's a longer title. Of a novel? No, 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 uh, not the novel, of but the, the new book that you have out, Objectivist... Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Exactly. Now, you said that you wouldn't mind... Yes, we are. You said that you wouldn't mind if I didn't read that book. You told that to my staff. That's right. And I didn't. I confess that to you. I want to be very basic here because there are many people who don't understand objectivism, who don't know what it is, but who have read much about Ayn Rand and have read her books and kind of want to know where she's coming from, if I can use that phrase. So let's just basically say what objectivism is. Okay? And make a long speech about it? Oh, not too long, no. No, because that's terribly difficult, you know. To begin with, it's a philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's a philosophic system. And philosophy is the science that studies the basic nature of existence. So it's a pretty technical subject. And anything I say briefly will not really do justice to my philosophy, but I can try to summarize well, it. Well, can I ask you some specifics then about it? Yes, sure. All right. How does, quote, I fit into the philosophy of objectivism. How does objectivism relate to me, the individual? What well, does it do for me? Are you a human being? Mm -hmm. Well, then it relates to you. It tells you how to lead your life and how to achieve things, how to be happy. It tells you the fundamental principles by which you can make your own choices. Above all, it tells you that you have the means to make these choices, that your mind is valid, that the reality you perceive really exists, and that is epistemology. Mm -hmm. That's a branch of philosophy, and it, then it tells you how to make, the base, by what principles, to guide the basic choices of your life. Now, there are many philosophies that would offer that to an individual. Oh, yes. There are religions that offer it. There yes. are forms of government that offer it. How does... Not forms of government. That's politics. That's a different branch. That comes later. Well, yes, but governments in some areas, in some instances, would define for you choices or dictate to you oh, yeah. how to live your life. Yeah. But I'll retract governments and just say religions are yeah. philosophies. All right. How does objectivism differ from the philosophies that many of us have been exposed to in our youths? Uh, philosophies based upon religions, theologians, dogmatists. The f very first difference, uh, objectivism tells you that it is not right, it is not proper to men to take anything on faith. Religion is a matter of faith. You accept a religion emotionally or because you were born to it. You have not chosen it rationally. What objectivism will tell you is that reason, man's reason is his basic means of survival. That is the most important faculty which he has, and he has to guide his life and make his choices by means of his rational faculty. Mm -hmm. He has to make his own choices, but he has to know how to make them. It is immoral for him to act on his emotions, to be guided by the whim of the moment. That objectivism holds as very wrong, very immoral, and Morality, in fact, consists of following your reason to the best of your ability. So that rationality is the basic virtue from which all the others proceed. Now, then you believe this for yourself, do you not? You, you accept this philosophy. Oh, it certainly. has guided your life. It has... Yes. I it has wanna... brought me where I am. Okay. So that you believe in Ayn Rand first and foremost. Oh, certainly. Not necessarily a God or a heaven or a hell or a government or some other people or forces beyond your control, but you believe in you. Uh, I wouldn't put it that way. I could say that, yes, it's true to some extent, but it's very inexact because it isn't a matter of faith. I have confidence in my own rational ability, but more than that, I also know that if I had less abilities than I have, no matter what happened to me, my mind is all that I have to guide me. So that if I were me or 
the lowest girl in the class, mentally, which I never was, uh, the same morality would apply to me. How smart are you? You brought this up now, that you were not the dumbest girl in the class. No. How, how smart were you in school when you were a little girl? Very. Yeah? I was the top student in... I went to two different schools in two different cities, and I was the top student there. In addition to being the top student, did they ever measure your intelligence and tell your mom and dad, oh, this girl is so bright, this girl is a jewel? No, by, in my time they didn't have those tests, not in Russia. But you knew that you were smart? Oh, yes. Um, did you feel that school was too slow? That yes. you were so far ahead of the material? Yes. How did you handle that? How did you school yourself really beyond the, the curriculum or curriculum is it of the school? Of interest to tell you? Yes, it really is. I always tried to sit in the back row of a class and I put a book in front of me and I was writing novels from the age of 10. I was writing screenplays at 8, but I was writing novels in class because I was, otherwise I would be terribly bored. I was never discovered because we had textbooks and if you read ahead uh, of the le lesson that they present in class, you can know what the teacher said. Mm -hmm. I had to read the textbook just once, and then I knew the course. So I, I really think it had a bad influence on me, uh, on my working discipline. It was too easy and too boring. How, but how did it affect your working discipline? I, I, I never had to make an effort. I certainly did have to when I began writing novels. That's really difficult. But in school, I had no difficulties. How was writing novels difficult for you? Because it's an enormous context that you have to keep in mind, an enormous structure. You can't do it inspirationally. You can't do it by just looking at the piece of paper once and deciding what you're going to do. It's a whole enormous structure, much more complicated than a building. And you have to keep it all in mind, never contradict your outline, and carry it out. It's killing difficult, but wonderful when you succeeded. Mm -hmm. I mean a good novel, of course. Do you recall what the first novel was you wrote when you were 10 years old, behind that book in the back row in school? The very first one? Uh, I remember the first screenplay. Oh, the novel I never finished. Oh. <laughs> uh, wait a moment. No, I did finish it. Yes, I remember it. The one I didn't finish, I started in college. Uh, I remember, but don't make me tell you the plot. No, I will not. But I would like to think that somewhere that manuscript is in a drawer in your house or in a box up in a closet. It's probably bombed out of existence oh, really? in Leningrad. So it exists then I, only in your mind, huh? Yeah. yeah. I didn't bring it with me. When did you discover or think up or allow objectivism to become your philosophy? From the time that I remember myself, which is two and a half, the first incident in my life I can remember, I was two and a half, and from that time on to the present, I never changed my convictions. Only at two and a half, I didn't know as much as I know now, but the fundamental approach was the same. I've never had to change. Why has it worked for you? Because it's true, because it corresponds to reality because it is the right philosophy by true, I mean. It corresponds to reality, therefore it permits me to deal with reality properly. And it, first of all, tells me I have to use my judgment, not my emotions, my judgment. Why do you think that religions have attracted more people to their philosophies than objectivism has attracted people to its? Well, first of all, they had much longer time. Now, remember, mm -hmm. religion is older than objectivism. I don't think I would want to attract as many people as religions do, but the real and serious answer is this. Religion is a primitive form of philosophy because what religion and philosophy have in common is that it's a system of background premises. Uh, it gives you a frame of reference, a context, in fundamental terms, and then you leave the concretes of your mm -hmm. life accordingly. So religion is primitive canned philosophy, if you want to. It gives you canned answers, 
and it says here you can rely on it you don't need to think it will tell you what to do in practically every situation just obey us take us on faith well why do people accept it because nobody can live without a philosophy mm -hmm. even the most primitive unthinking yeah. man needs something to tie all of his actions ideas and his life together he needs integration religion provides it to him ready-made philosophy properly does the same thing but it offers an idea a context to his mind and it demands of him that he judge it that he use his own intelligence to understand and then to accept the kind of basic premises that he'll live his life by in my youth i was well schooled in religious doctrine and I would not for a second say to you that I now believe in it as dogmatically as I did when I was a young person and had it taught That's to me by rote, all right? But I still wouldn't want to think that all of us pass through the experience of life and then when it comes to an end, that's simply the end of it and it has no other purpose. I'm kind of trapped there. I would like to think that there is something beyond the end of this thing we call life. But tell me, supposing you were convinced that there isn't, what difference would it make to you now? Oh, it would make a tremendous difference to me. Yeah, I think so. But it, for the better. Well, you see, I think for the worse. Why? I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't like to believe that uh, when this body dies, that this spirit is, all, is now gone, that it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's defeated. It's not, not defeat. Uh, think of it the other way. If you know that this life is all that you have, wouldn't you make the most of it? Well, Rather I, than think, well, uh, well if, I if I don't enjoy this life, I'll have limitless number of lives coming yet. I can be wasteful of my own life. No, I don't think that. I don't think that I would want to waste a second of this. I do waste some seconds, and I'll bet Ayn Rand wastes some, oh, a lot. some seconds oh, also. Oh, they're not wasted. Yes, you mean I'm doing nothing, whatever. Mm -hmm. Just drifting. Well, or creatively wasting time. Creative waste, that's right. All right. But I still would like to think, not that I want to come back as a Maharaji or anything like that, but I just, I tend to think of this whole thing as ongoing, that there is an eternity, and that we are going to be a part of that eternity, that we aren't just corpses and graves when we die. But we aren't corpses and graves. We are not there. Don't you understand that when this life is finished, you're not there to say, oh, how terrible that I'm a corpse. No. Well, this is true. It's yeah. finished. And uh, what I've always uh, thought was a sentence from some Greek philosopher. I don't, unfortunately, remember who it was that I read at 16, and it's affected me all my life. I will not die. It's the world that will end. And that's absolutely true. And, you know, for me now, it should be a serious question because my time is fairly limited and I have the same feeling that I will enjoy life to the last moment and when it's the end I don't have to worry about it I'm not there it's too bad that the world will end and I think a very wonderful world will end with me but I've had my time I can't complain Ayn Rand does not fear death does she no only the death of someone I love, but not my own. How does Ayn Rand philosopher view the United States of America today? People waiting in gasoline lines, people fearing a possible recession, people wondering whether we will survive as a nation because of military posturing by other countries around the world. Tell me how you feel. About That's it. a pretty big mm -hmm. statement right there, but first of all, to sum it up, I feel that this country is being destroyed by its philosophy, specifically by its universities. The most dangerous thing in this country today are the universities because they're teaching the kind of ideas that would necessarily have to lead to the destruction of this country. I think that the American people is too good for that kind of program. You notice that the people are turning to the right. That's a very healthy sign, but there is no leadership on, on the right.
There is no intellectual leadership. There are no ideas. Uh, and it's very possible that the people will be defeated for lack of proper intellectual leadership. However, the basic premises... Excuse basic me, but then you don't mean Harvard intellectual leadership or Yale intellectual leadership. I mean a Harvard that would be preaching American ideas more specifically. Reason, individualism, capitalism. If an institution of the intellectual prestige, which they don't deserve today, but they deserved it at one time, of Harvard, if an institution of that magnitude were preaching the proper ideas, that is the ideas on which America originally was based, or to say it briefly, the philosophy of Aristotle, which was the father of this country, who was. Uh, if they were doing that, you could have the biggest renaissance in the world, still not too late even now. You could have a better renaissance than the first one. This country would come back to life. But today, when all those institutions from Harvard on down are preaching collectivism, mysticism, and above all, altruism, self-sacrifice of yourself, the giving up, the resignation, this, all the disgusting kind of ideas that the whole world has been nurturing for centuries, when they do that, this country can survive. Can you give me a, can you be a little bit more specific? I've never sure. been to Harvard, I've never been to class there, but can you give me an That's example? That's your advantage. Oh, thank you. Of how they are teaching sacrifice, how they are teaching altruism? Well, open daily paper and look at Mr. Carter, a very peculiar creature, who is telling you that we're going to uh, overcome the oil shortage by driving less, by giving up. Let us all make a sacrifice. Let's lower our standard of living and we'll all be living better. Now, is that a proper philosophy to tell a country that has pride and self-esteem? At one time, with all the faults in American intellectual equipment, and there were a lot of faults, at least pe people were taught pride in their own country and in the good aspects, the great achievements of this country. Today, you're supposed to apologize to every naked savage anywhere on the globe because you are more prosperous, because you've earned your money. You have to feel guilty and apologize for it while he hasn't and doesn't intend to learn from you. He just wants your money. That's what we're being taught. Why are we being taught? Because the ruling philosopher today in Harvard and everywhere else is Immanuel Kant, and that's the real villain of our age. It's not Karl you mean, Marx. You mean he's the one, huh? He is the Kant one. Kant is the one. Yeah. Okay. It's not Karl Marx, and it's not even religion, so I do not approve of religion, as you know. But those are not the villains. The villains is Immanuel Kant, who preached that man's mind is not valid, that the things you perceive are not there, they're not real. Things in themselves, as he preached, are something which exists in another dimension. Your world is only phenomenal, as he called it, and then there is this noumenal world, which you cannot perceive in any way, whatever, and that noumenal world is the true reality. Only you can't perceive it, so you better live here on Earth and do your duty. And uh, your duty is some kind of voice that comes from these other dimensions, which you can't know. Well, how does he know? He doesn't tell you. But he tells you that uh, morally you have to do your duty. What does your duty consist of? Of doing things in which you can take no possible interest and no advantage to yourself. You know that he is even worse than an altruist. An altruist would tell you, you shouldn't be happy, but you should sacrifice for other people and then your moral. Kant goes beyond it. He says, if you do things because you have any goal, whatever, even the welfare of others, your uh, action is not moral. Or as he puts it, it has no moral significance. To be truly moral, you should do things out of which you get nothing whatever, neither for yourself nor for others. 
if you can achieve that kind of uh, being a total zero offered for being eaten by any cannibal, then you're moral. Now that's the philosopher who rules today's life. If that is what the universities are preaching, Kant himself and all the endless variations of him and the derivatives from him, all modern philosophy are little illegitimate Kantians, if you know what I mean. If that's what children are taught, once they leave college, what do they bring to life? What you see today. We're kind of reaching the visible climax of Kantianism. They are, take dope, they try to kill their mind in every way possible, they leave range of the moment, they have no values, no goals, and no selfishness. Or well, they're terribly unselfish, because they haven't got one independent idea in the world. Tell me the value of selfishness. Use another word, self-esteem. The value of selfishness is that you esteem yourself as a value, that you live according to your nature, which means by the judgment of your own mind, and you respect your own mind, you respect your own ability to do the right thing. Therefore, you respect your, the possibility of being a morally virtuous person. And you regard yourself as a value worth preserving. Let me bring it down from Kant a little bit to a bromide that I had drummed into me as a child. And maybe you've heard it. Happiness comes from making other people happy. Oh, yes. I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> Who hasn't heard it? And that's the trouble. Let's aim at the day when people will not hear it anymore. Because it isn't true, it isn't justifiable, and the first question you would have to ask is, why? Why is it good to want others to be happy, but not yourself? And I suppose you will be told that, well, but they will work for your happiness, and not their own. Well, it's like an exchange of Christmas presents that neither party wants, but that you have to exchange present and you're not allowed morally to do something for yourself. Whereas what I say, you can make others happy when and if those others mean something to you selfishly. If you love them, then you want to make them happy. Fine. If you don't love them, that's not a moral crime. You don't have to love everybody. You cannot love everybody because it's a meaningless expression. You can love only those whom you value. And if they contribute to your happiness, you contribute to theirs. That's fine. But each one of you has to be selfish about it. Supposing somebody were in love with you and said, I, I love you because you're so bad, so I sacrifice myself and I'm going to love you. Would you accept that or no, would you say it's the most? No, sir, I wouldn't either. That's the most insulting thing anyone could have said to you. And yet that's what altruism would demand. And there is a great Russian writer who tried to practice it, Dostoevsky, who did marry a poor, uh, stupid little uh, seamstress who, whom he didn't love at all, out of the desire to make her happy. See, the end of it was she committed suicide. Now that is an altruist practice. That's what altruism leads to. How about it's more blessed to give than to receive? Well, that's obviously the welfare state. That's uh, clearly motivated slogan uh, to please uh, give me something and you'll be blessed but I will keep you your material goods now you don't mind getting presents do you mm, yes I do do you really but only from the people whom I uh, love or friends or my husband but that's what I mean uh, yes that I like but from strangers I don't accept them no but within your family and the people that you care deeply about you would give them a present too oh yes certainly when I wanted to, but I wouldn't consider that a moral duty, and I wouldn't consider that a virtue at all. Uh, but you were saying, may I bring up something mm -hmm. uh, that we were discussing during the commercial? The worst thing today is the attacks on ability. The, uh, I call this today's atmosphere the age of envy, actually. And I asked you whether uh, you would be attacked by people for your success. And I don't know whether you want to give the answer to the audience that y you gave me. Yes, yes, I am. Well, that's what I regard as the most immoral thing on earth. To attack a man, not for his flaws, 
but for his virtues. Because to make a success of yourself in any line of rational activity is a great virtue. And they, people will attack you for exercising your ability, for hard work, for consistency, for ambition. And they will want to make you feel guilty of it. Mm -hmm. That is the greatest evil according to my philosophy. And wait, say that again. The greatest evil, according to your philosophy, is to attack an individual because of virtue. What I call it is uh, to experience or act on hatred of the good for being the good. That is attacking people for their virtues, for their achievements, for anything they have which is a value, actually. Not for their flaws and not for their evil. In fact, people who preach that are the ones who are mawkish about the evil people, the failures, the liars, the cheats. Everybody who is weak suddenly acquires some kind of value. But anyone who is a success has to be attacked for his success. And look at how you have been attacked. Oh, I know. How you have been criticized. That there are you many, know that? There are many people in this country, forgive me, in this world who think you're daft. They don't. They want you to sing that. Well, obviously... Oh, I, I, I hear you. Yeah, okay, okay. Obviously, why? Because I'm preaching something absolutely, totally the opposite of the Kantian philosophy by which they live. Kantian and uh, derivatives. What do you think is going to happen to the United States of America if we keep going this way? If we keep going this way, total collapse. But I still think that we won't be keep going this way that what will save this country is not its intellectuals, but the people. Because they've rebelled already without much pr intellectual prodding, that they've already becoming aware of the fact that we have to go to the right and not more welfare state. That's a great, great uh, uh, tribute to the intelligence of the people. Only I want to make something clear. I'm not a conservative. I think that today's conservatives are worse than today's liberals. I think they are, if anyone destroys this country, it will be the conservatives. Because they do not know how to preach capitalism, uh, to explain it to the people, because they do nothing except apologize, and because they're all altruists. They're all based on religious altruism. And on that combination of ideas, you cannot save this country. Mm -hmm. The trouble with this country is that it was based on the right philosophy originally by the founding fathers, but they did not have a moral code to match the, the political ideas which they had. You love this country, don't you? Passionately. Yeah. Very, very much. And consciously. I love it for its ideas. And I've seen enough of the other side so I can appreciate this country. You might even get emotional about this country, huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> Why do you want me to get emotional? <laughs> might even thank God for it, huh? Yeah. yeah. I may not uh, literally mean a God, but I like what that expression uh, means. Thank God or God bless you. Uh, it means the highest possible to me. And I would cer certainly thank God for this country. And thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> That's what come down. Thank you very much for and, asking me. I enjoyed it. Okay. And please come back and God bless you. Thank you. Same to you.